Hello, I'm Sujit, though many know me simply as Suraj, a name I chose for its simplicity and clarity. On YouTube, I got viral by Ravi, a name that also reflects the sun, symbolizing light and enlightenment. As a Virgo in Western astrology, I embody qualities like imagination, precision, and a deep-seated curiosity. These traits have been my guiding stars on an extraordinary journey. Today, I'm excited to take you on a compelling exploration of one of the most enigmatic challenges in mathematics, the Riemann hypothesis. This journey has been fueled by my fascination with the intricate dance of numbers and my determination to unravel the mysteries of the Riemann zeta function. I invite you to join me as I delve into the depths of this profound problem, sharing insights and discoveries that have emerged along the way. Together, we will explore the intricacies of this hypothesis and uncover the potential breakthroughs that lie within. As a child, there was one full moon night in summer that I'll never forget. The air was warm and gentle, with a soothing breeze that rustled the leaves. I was sitting by a tranquil water body, mesmerized by the interplay of moonlight and waves. The surface of the water shimmered with the dance of lights, each ripple creating ever-changing patterns that seemed to come alive in the moonlight. I was captivated by the intricate designs that emerged and evolved on the water. The patterns were never static, they shifted and transformed with each passing moment, creating a mesmerizing ballet of light and movement. I watched, utterly entranced, as the reflections and ripples wove together to form a tapestry of dynamic, fluid shapes. Time seemed to stand still as I lost myself in this visual symphony. I didn't notice how the hours slipped away, completely absorbed in the beauty and complexity of the patterns before me. That night, I discovered something profound about myself, a deep love for finding patterns and connections in everything around me. This fascination with patterns and their constant evolution has stayed with me, guiding my journey into the world of mathematics and beyond. As I grew up, my fascination with patterns and numbers naturally guided me towards the field of accounting. It was a discipline that satisfied my need for structure and order, while also challenging me to find the underlying connections in complex financial data. When I took up accounting for higher studies, I was introduced to a mathematical constant that would later become a pivotal element in my life, e. At that time, E was just a constant to me, a tool used in various financial formulas. It appeared in calculations for financial valuation, option pricing, and continuous compounding. I learned to apply E without truly grasping its deeper significance, seeing it as a means to an end rather than a subject of wonder in itself. I would use it in formulas to determine present values, calculate compound interest over continuous intervals, and assess the pricing of financial options. These applications were practical, rooted in the real-world demands of financial management. Yet, something about E intrigued me, even if I didn't fully realize it at the time. There was an elegance to how it seamlessly integrated into so many different aspects of finance, a subtle hint that this constant was more than just a number. I didn't know then that my encounter with E would later lead me down a path of mathematical exploration and discovery. For now, it was simply a part of my studies, a constant in the formulas I used, without knowing it would soon become a constant in my life, shaping the way I viewed the world and eventually guiding me toward the enigmatic world of the Riemann hypothesis. In accounting, I often found myself using halving and averaging in various calculations, from financial ratios to performance metrics. These methods were second nature to me, tools of the trade that helped simplify complex data into more manageable insights. Little did I know at the time that these simple mathematical operations had deep connections to the Riemann hypothesis, an idea that was far from my thoughts back then. Averaging seemed to be a universal concept, not just confined to accounting but woven into the very fabric of science and mathematics. I noticed its presence in the calculation of kinetic energy, where it smoothed out the chaotic motion of particles into a meaningful measure. It appeared in the root mean square, RMS, velocity of gases, giving a sense of the average speed of gas molecules in a system, despite their constant, random movement. The concept of averaging was also integral in geometry, whether it was in finding the area of a triangle by averaging the base and height or determining midpoints in coordinate geometry. Trigonometry, too, made use of averaging, especially in formulas that dealt with finding angles and distances, or in the calculation of the centroid of a triangle. Beyond these, averaging found its way into physics, where it was used in the laws of motion and in calculating the center of mass. In statistics, it was the foundation of mean values and standard deviations, essential for making sense of data. 
In economics, averages helped in determining trends and forecasting, while in engineering, they were used to optimize designs and processes. At the time, I viewed these as isolated applications, each serving its purpose in its respective field. I didn't realize that the concept of averaging, a fundamental idea in mathematics, was a thread that connected various disciplines. Nor did I see the profound connection it had with the Riemann hypothesis, a connection that would later become clear as I delved deeper into the world of number theory. These encounters with averaging, though seemingly routine, were slowly building a foundation for a much larger understanding. They were teaching me to see the world in terms of balance and symmetry, concepts that would later resonate with the mathematical structures I would explore. What began as simple arithmetic in accounting would eventually lead me to the elegant, intricate world of prime numbers and the deep mysteries that lie within the Riemann hypothesis. Although I left science behind after school to focus on accounting, my curiosity never let go of physics. I believed that somewhere within the laws of nature lay the answers to my deepest questions. So, I continued to read and explore physics on my own, hoping to bridge the gap between what I had learned in school and the greater truths of the universe. As I delved deeper, I began to realize just how vast that gap was. The physics taught in school was a mere shadow of the complexity and beauty of the real world. My idea of a static solar system, with planets orbiting in neat, predictable paths, was completely wrong. The solar system is a dynamic, ever-changing place, with gravitational interactions, orbital shifts, and chaotic elements that defy the simplicity of textbook diagrams. Even the picture of atoms I had in my mind, tiny, solid spheres with electrons neatly orbiting the nucleus, was far from accurate. The reality was much stranger and more fascinating, with electrons existing in probability clouds, their positions and velocities governed by the mysterious laws of quantum mechanics. Newton's elegant equations, which describe the motion of falling apples, fail when applied to the complex trajectories of satellites slingshotting around planets, where relativistic effects and the intricacies of celestial mechanics come into play. As I continued to read, I encountered the mind-bending concepts of quantum mechanics and general relativity, which shattered my simplistic understanding of the universe. Quantum mechanics introduced me to a world where particles could exist in multiple states at once, where uncertainty and probability ruled. General relativity, on the other hand, reshaped my understanding of space and time, showing me that they were not absolute but intertwined in a cosmic fabric that could bend and warp under the influence of gravity. The more I learned, the more I realized how little was taught in the school curriculum, especially in the Indian education system. Concepts like the quantum nature of particles, the curvature of space-time, and the incredible vastness of the universe as revealed by the Hubble Ultra Deep Field images were barely touched upon, if at all. These images, showing countless galaxies scattered across the dark expanse of space, each containing billions of stars, made me acutely aware of the enormity of the universe and how limited our school-level understanding really was. It became clear to me that the physics I learned in school was just the tip of the iceberg. The true nature of the universe, as revealed by modern science, was far more complex, interconnected, and awe-inspiring than I had ever imagined. This realization fueled my desire to keep learning, to seek out the deeper truths that lie beyond the surface, and to connect these truths to the mathematical patterns I had always been drawn to. This continuous thirst for knowledge, the drive to understand the underlying principles of the universe, eventually led me to the Riemann hypothesis, a problem that, like the universe itself, was both daunting and filled with endless possibilities. As I continued my journey through the world of physics, I encountered concepts that were as intriguing as they were perplexing. The more I read, the more I was drawn into the strange and counterintuitive realm of quantum mechanics, QM. Here, the classical laws of physics that I had grown up with seemed to dissolve, replaced by principles that defied common sense. Concepts like wave-particle duality, wave-function collapse, quantum decoherence, the quantum eraser, and the measurement problem in the double-slit experiment left me grappling to understand a reality that was far more mysterious than I had ever imagined. Wave-particle duality one of the first challenges I faced was accepting the idea of wave-particle duality. In the world of quantum mechanics, particles like electrons and photons don't fit neatly into the categories of a wave or particle. Instead, they exhibit properties of both. When observed in one way, they behave like particles, discrete, point-like objects. Yet, under different circumstances, they display wave-like characteristics, spreading out and interfering like ripples on a pond. 
This duality is famously demonstrated in the double slit experiment where particles can create an interference pattern typically associated with waves even when fired one at a time. Wave function collapse. The wave function is a mathematical description of the quantum state of a particle representing all the possible outcomes of a measurement. Before a measurement is made, the particle exists in a superposition of all these possibilities, meaning it could be in multiple states simultaneously. However, upon measurement, this superposition collapses into a single, definite state. This phenomenon, known as wave function collapse, is at the heart of the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, raising profound questions about the nature of reality and the role of the observer. Quantum decoherence Quantum decoherence is a process that helps explain why we don't observe superpositions in the macroscopic world. When a quantum system interacts with its environment, the superposition states effectively decohere or become entangled with the environment, causing the system to appear as though it has collapsed into a single state. This interaction with the environment effectively hides the superposition, making it look like classical behavior to an observer, even though at the quantum level, the superpositions still exist. Quantum Eraser and Measurement Problem The quantum eraser experiment takes the weirdness of quantum mechanics even further. In this experiment, information about the path a particle takes can be erased after the particle has already been detected, effectively restoring the interference pattern associated with wave behavior. This suggests that the nature of reality is not only non-local but also retrocausal, where future events can influence the past. The double slit experiment encapsulates many of these strange quantum phenomena. When particles pass through two slits, they can interfere with themselves as if they were waves, creating an interference pattern on a detector screen. However, if one attempts to measure which slit a particle goes through, the interference pattern disappears and the particle behaves as if it went through one slit or the other, not both. This experiment highlights the mysterious measurement problem where the act of measurement seems to alter the outcome of an event, challenging our understanding of reality itself. At first, I found it incredibly hard to believe these concepts. They seemed to defy everything I thought I knew about the world. How could something be both a wave and a particle? How could the mere act of observation change the state of a system? The more I tried to wrap my head around these ideas, the more elusive they became. It wasn't until I started exploring the Riemann hypothesis, RH, that I began to see a deeper connection. The RH, like quantum mechanics, delves into the fundamental nature of reality, this time through the lens of mathematics. Just as quantum mechanics challenges our notions of particles and waves, the RH challenges our understanding of numbers and their distribution, particularly prime numbers. I began to see parallels between the strange, hidden truths of quantum mechanics and the hidden patterns within the prime numbers described by the RH. Both realms revealed that beneath the surface of what we perceive, there is a more intricate, mysterious structure waiting to be uncovered. In my journey to understand the RH, I started to appreciate that the counterintuitive nature of these quantum concepts might not be as foreign to me as I once thought. They both involved finding patterns in chaos, discovering order in what seemed like randomness. It was this realization that propelled me further into the mathematical depths of the RH, where I hoped to uncover the hidden symmetries that govern the distribution of prime numbers, just as I had once sought to understand the strange world of quantum physics. As I continued to delve into the enigma of quantum mechanics, I realized there were still more profound and perplexing aspects I hadn't yet fully grasped. The quantum world was full of paradoxes and mysteries that seemed to challenge our very understanding of reality. Quantum Entanglement One of the most striking phenomena in quantum mechanics is entanglement. When particles become entangled, their quantum states become interdependent, such that the state of one particle instantly affects the state of another, no matter how far apart they are. This spooky action at a distance, as Einstein called it, defies our classical notions of locality and causality. The idea that two particles can be connected in this way, with no apparent exchange of information, seemed to challenge the very fabric of space and time. The Many Worlds Interpretation to address the puzzling nature of quantum measurement, several interpretations of quantum mechanics have been proposed. One such interpretation is the many worlds interpretation, MWI, which suggests that every quantum event spawns a branching of the universe into multiple, non-interacting parallel worlds. According to MWI, all possible outcomes of a quantum measurement are realized, each in a separate, parallel universe. 
This interpretation eliminates the need for wave function collapse but introduces the notion of a potentially infinite number of parallel realities, each evolving independently. The observer effect. The observer effect is another concept that challenges our understanding. It refers to the fact that the act of observing or measuring a quantum system inevitably alters its state. This effect is not merely a limitation of our measuring instruments but is deeply embedded in the nature of quantum systems. It raises questions about the role of consciousness and the observer in the measurement process, suggesting that reality might be fundamentally different from what we perceive. Quantum superposition Superposition, the idea that a quantum system can exist in multiple states simultaneously, is another mind-bending aspect of quantum mechanics. A classic example is Schrodinger's cat, a thought experiment where a cat in a sealed box is considered to be simultaneously alive and dead until observed. This superposition of states persists until a measurement collapses the system into one of the possible outcomes. The concept of superposition challenges our classical intuitions about the nature of reality and the limits of what we can know. Quantum tunneling Quantum tunneling is a phenomenon where particles pass through energy barriers that they classically shouldn't be able to cross. This occurs because, in quantum mechanics, particles are described by wave functions that can extend beyond classical barriers. Quantum tunneling has practical implications, such as in the operation of tunnel diodes and in nuclear fusion, where it allows particles to overcome potential energy barriers. The uncertainty principle. Heisenbeck's uncertainty principle posits that certain pairs of physical properties, like position and momentum, cannot be simultaneously measured with arbitrary precision. The more accurately we know one property, the less precisely we can know the other. This principle underscores the fundamental limits of measurement and challenges our ability to predict and understand quantum systems with complete certainty. Quantum gravity and unified theories. Finally, the quest to unify quantum mechanics with general relativity into a single theory of quantum gravity remains one of the biggest challenges in theoretical physics. Quantum mechanics deals with the very small, while general relativity addresses the very large. Finding a coherent framework that incorporates both is crucial for understanding the fundamental nature of space, time, and gravity. As I explored these enigmatic aspects of quantum mechanics, I found myself grappling with concepts that defied conventional logic and challenged the very nature of reality. Each discovery seemed to peel back another layer of the universe's complexity, revealing deeper mysteries and more profound questions. It became clear that the quantum world was not only a realm of strange and counterintuitive phenomena but also a domain rich with potential connections to the mathematical mysteries I was beginning to uncover. The more I learned about these quantum phenomena, the more I realized how they mirrored the complexity and depth I found in the Riemann hypothesis. Both realms, quantum mechanics and number theory, reveal that beneath the apparent randomness and chaos, there are underlying structures and patterns waiting to be discovered. This parallel between quantum mechanics and the Riemann hypothesis fueled my determination to delve deeper into both fields, seeking to uncover the hidden truths that lie at their intersections. The nature of time has always been a deeply intriguing and perplexing concept, one that challenges our fundamental understanding of reality. From its everyday experience as a seemingly linear and constant flow to its more complex manifestations in the realms of physics and philosophy, time remains one of the most elusive and enigmatic aspects of our existence. Time in classical physics In classical physics, time is treated as an absolute, linear quantity. Sir Isaac Newton's framework of absolute time presented time as an ever-present backdrop against which events occur. According to this view, time marches forward uniformly and independently of the events happening within it. Newton's concept of absolute time allowed for a straightforward understanding of motion and causality, one where the past, present, and future are neatly separated and order is maintained through a constant flow of time. In everyday life, this classical view of time seems intuitive. We use clocks and calendars to measure and track time, organizing our activities and planning our future based on a continuous, linear progression. Time appears to flow at a steady rate, unaffected by the events we experience or the speed at which we move. This everyday experience of time as an unchanging, predictable dimension is something we rely on for everything from scheduling appointments to reflecting on past events. Time in Relativity Einstein's theory of relativity revolutionized our understanding of time by introducing the concept of space-time, a unified framework where time and space are intertwined. 
According to relativity, time is not an absolute entity but is relative to the observer's frame of reference. This means that time can vary depending on how fast an observer is moving and how close they are to massive objects. In special relativity, Einstein showed that time dilates, or slows down, for objects moving at high speeds relative to an observer. This time dilation effect becomes more pronounced as an object approaches the speed of light. For example, astronauts traveling at near-light speeds would experience time at a different rate compared to those on Earth, a phenomenon known as time dilation. This revelation has been experimentally confirmed through observations of particles in accelerators and highly accurate atomic clocks flown on airplanes. General relativity extends this concept further by incorporating gravity into the time equation. According to general relativity, massive objects like planets and stars warp the fabric of spacetime around them. This warping causes time to pass more slowly in stronger gravitational fields. Near a massive object, such as a black hole, time slows down significantly compared to regions with weaker gravity. This is known as a gravitational time dilation and has been observed in experiments involving precise measurements of time near massive bodies. Quantum mechanics and time. In the realm of quantum mechanics, the nature of time becomes even more complex. Quantum mechanics deals with probabilities and uncertainties at the smallest scales and its treatment of time can be quite different from classical and relativistic views. Time in quantum mechanics is typically treated as a parameter, not as a dynamic variable interacting with quantum states. However, when quantum mechanics and relativity intersect, such as in attempts to formulate a theory of quantum gravity, the nature of time becomes a crucial and unresolved question. Quantum gravity theories, such as loop quantum gravity and string theory, attempt to reconcile the principles of quantum mechanics with the curvature of spacetime described by general relativity. In these theories, time might emerge as a derived concept rather than a fundamental dimension. For instance, in loop quantum gravity, spacetime is quantized and time may not be a continuous entity but rather a series of discrete events. In string theory, the nature of time is linked to the behavior of fundamental strings and higher dimensional objects, challenging our conventional understanding of temporal progression. Philosophical perspectives on time. Philosophically, time has been a subject of contemplation for millennia. Ancient philosophers like Aristotle and Augustine grappled with questions about the nature of time, its passage, and its relation to existence. Aristotle viewed time as a measure of change, tied to the movement of objects and the succession of events. Augustine, on the other hand, struggled with the idea of time's relation to God and eternity, questioning whether time is an objective reality or a construct of the human mind. In contemporary philosophy, debates continue about the nature of time. Presentism holds that only the present moment is real, with the past and future being mere concepts or abstractions. Eternalism, in contrast, posits that past, present, and future events are equally real and exist in a four-dimensional block universe where time is just another dimension. The growing field of philosophy of time examines how our experiences and perceptions of time align with scientific theories and metaphysical concepts. The Enigma of Time Despite the profound insights gained from relativity, quantum mechanics, and philosophy, time remains an enigmatic concept. Its dual nature, both as a continuous, flowing entity and as a flexible, observer-dependent dimension, presents challenges for our understanding. The intersection of time with other fundamental concepts like causality, entropy, and consciousness further complicates the picture. In my journey of understanding, grappling with the nature of time has been a challenging but illuminating experience. Time is not just a backdrop to our lives but an intrinsic part of the fabric of reality. As I explored its many dimensions, whether through the linear progression of classical physics, the relativistic distortions of space-time, or the quantum uncertainties, I came to appreciate the depth and complexity of this fundamental aspect of existence. The more I delved into these concepts, the more I realized that time, like the mysteries of quantum mechanics and the Riemann hypothesis, holds profound truths that continue to challenge and inspire our quest for knowledge. Navigating the belief systems and scientific models that shape our understanding of the universe can be challenging, especially when deeply ingrained cultural and religious views come into play. As someone born into a Hindu tradition, which often posits time as eternal and cyclical, reconciling this with scientific concepts like the Big Bang Theory can be particularly difficult. Here's a closer examination of how to approach this conflict and some critiques of the Big Bang model that might provide further context. 
cultural and religious perspectives on time. In Hindu cosmology, time is often perceived as cyclical rather than linear. The concept of time in Hindu philosophy includes vast epochs or yugas which repeat in an endless cycle of creation, preservation, and dissolution. This cyclical view contrasts with the linear perspective of time often seen in Western science, where time is seen as a continuous progression from past to future. This eternal and cyclical view of time suggests that the universe goes through infinite cycles of creation and destruction, which can make it challenging to accept models like the Big Bang theory that propose a definite starting point for the universe. In Hinduism, the universe is seen as undergoing continuous transformations rather than originating from a singular, discrete event. Criticisms of the Big Bang Model While the Big Bang theory is the most widely accepted scientific explanation for the origin of the universe, it is not without its criticisms and limitations. Here are some points of critique. 1. Initial singularity and quantum gravity. The Big Bang theory suggests that the universe began from an infinitely dense point known as a singularity. This idea presents significant challenges because it implies conditions where the known laws of physics break down. At such extreme densities, a theory of quantum gravity, combining quantum mechanics and general relativity, is needed to describe the universe's origins. Currently, we lack a complete theory of quantum gravity, which leaves the singularity concept somewhat speculative. 2. Cosmic inflation The theory of cosmic inflation, which proposes a rapid expansion of the universe just after the Big Bang, was introduced to address certain issues like the uniformity of the cosmic microwave background, CMB, and the flatness problem. However, while inflation explains some observed phenomena, it also introduces new questions, such as what caused inflation to start and stop. The precise mechanisms of inflation and its relationship to the Big Bang remain areas of active research and debate. 3. Dark matter and dark energy. Observations suggest that about 27% of the universe is composed of dark matter and about 68% of dark energy. These components are not yet fully understood and their existence challenges our current models of cosmology. The nature of dark matter and dark energy and their role in the evolution of the universe add complexity to the Big Bang model and highlight gaps in our understanding. 4. Alternative cosmological models. There are alternative theories to the Big Bang model, such as the steady-state theory, which proposes that the universe has always existed in a constant state with continuous creation of matter. While largely superseded by the Big Bang theory, these models offer different perspectives on the universe's origin and evolution. Other alternatives include cyclical models of the universe, which align more closely with the Hindu concept of eternal time and suggest that the universe undergoes endless cycles of expansion and contraction. 5. Philosophical and Theological Questions The Big Bang Theory raises profound philosophical and theological questions about the origin of the universe. If the universe began from a singularity, what caused this initial event? The theory does not provide an explanation for the cause of the Big Bang itself or the ultimate reason for the existence of the universe. This lack of a definitive answer leaves room for philosophical and theological interpretations that challenge the scientific view. Reconciling Scientific and Cultural Perspectives Reconciling the Big Bang Theory with a cyclical or eternal view of time requires a nuanced approach. It's important to recognize that scientific theories and cultural or religious beliefs can coexist in a complementary rather than mutually exclusive manner. 1. Cyclical Models of Cosmology Some modern cosmological models propose that the universe undergoes a series of expansions and contractions akin to a cyclical view of time. The idea of a big bounce, where the universe expands and then contracts before a new big bang occurs, aligns with some traditional views of eternal cycles and might offer a bridge between scientific models and cultural beliefs. 2. Metaphorical interpretations. Viewing scientific theories as metaphorical representations rather than literal truths can help integrate them with cultural and religious perspectives. The Big Bang Theory, for example, can be seen as describing the observable history of the universe rather than its ultimate nature or purpose. 3. Philosophical Integration Philosophical exploration of the nature of time, existence, and the universe can provide a framework for integrating scientific and cultural perspectives. By considering the broader implications of both scientific theories and cultural beliefs, one can develop a more holistic understanding of reality. 
In conclusion, while reconciling the eternal and cyclical view of time with the Big Bang theory presents challenges, it also opens up opportunities for deeper exploration and integration. By critically examining both scientific and cultural perspectives, one can find ways to appreciate and incorporate diverse views on the nature of time and the universe. As I delved deeper into the mysteries of the universe, I found myself grappling with concepts that challenged everything I thought I knew. One of the most perplexing ideas was the nature of time itself. Born and raised in a culture that views time as eternal, cyclical, and intertwined with the rhythms of the cosmos, I found it difficult to reconcile this with the linear, one-way arrow of time presented in modern physics. The more I studied, the more I became aware of how little was taught in school about the true nature of time and space. Concepts like redshift, the arrow of time, and the light cone were alien to the simplistic models I had learned as a student. Redshift was a particularly challenging idea. It was presented as a fundamental piece of evidence for the Big Bang theory, showing that distant galaxies are moving away from us, their light stretched into longer, redder wavelengths. This expanding universe suggested a beginning, a singular moment in time when everything burst forth from a single point. But this linear narrative clashed with my deeper belief in time as something eternal and cyclic, not confined to a one-way trajectory from a single event. The idea that the universe was expanding outwards in all directions, stretching time and space, was difficult to swallow. Then there was the arrow of time, the idea that time flows in one direction, always moving forward, never backward. This concept, rooted in the second law of thermodynamics, insists that entropy, or disorder, always increases. It explains why we remember the past but not the future, why broken things do not spontaneously reassemble, and why life itself seems to move inexorably towards decay. But I couldn't help but feel that this was only part of the story. Where was the cyclical nature of time that ancient wisdom spoke of? What about the idea of time as a wheel, constantly turning, with beginnings and endings intertwined? The light cone was another concept that stretched my understanding. It represented the boundaries of what we can observe and what can influence us. The idea that light, traveling at a finite speed, creates a cone-shaped boundary in space-time that separates the causally connected events from those that are forever beyond our reach was mind-bending. It was like looking at the universe through a tunnel, knowing that everything outside the light cone was beyond our ability to perceive or affect. This concept made the universe feel like a vast, incomprehensible expanse, where time and space were rigidly structured by the speed of light, and I was left wondering what lay beyond those boundaries. Quantum mechanics only deepened my frustration. The more I learned about wave-particle duality, wave-function collapse, quantum decoherence, and the measurement problem in the double-slit experiment, the more elusive the answers became. The idea that particles could exist in multiple states simultaneously until observed, that the act of measurement could fundamentally alter reality, and that reality itself was somehow fluid and dependent on observation, was a far cry from the deterministic world of classical physics. Wave-particle duality was particularly baffling. How could light and matter behave as both particles and waves, depending on how they were observed? The collapse of the wave function, where a quantum system seemed to settle into a definite state upon measurement, was equally perplexing. It suggested that reality itself was somehow indeterminate, fluid, and shaped by observation, a concept that defied the logic of a universe governed by fixed, unchanging laws. Quantum decoherence added another layer of complexity, describing how quantum systems lose their quantum properties when interacting with their environment, leading to the classical world we observe. This transition from the quantum to the classical, where the bizarre rules of quantum mechanics seem to vanish, was difficult to grasp. And the quantum eraser experiment, where information seemed to retroactively affect the outcome of measurements, challenged my understanding of causality and time. I was fascinated and frustrated in equal measure. These concepts seemed to paint a picture of a universe that was inherently one-way, linear, and deterministic in its classical sense, yet disturbingly uncertain and fluid on the quantum level. I felt trapped in a framework that didn't allow for the cyclic, eternal, and interconnected nature of time and reality that I believed in. The more I thought about these concepts, the more I realized that I lacked the mathematical and conceptual tools to challenge them. I didn't have the cyclic models or the multidimensional frameworks that could offer an alternative view. It felt like I was trying to fight a battle with only half the weapons at my disposal. 
I was left wondering if there were deeper symmetries, hidden cycles, or uncharted dimensions that could reconcile these seemingly one-way stories with the timeless, cyclic nature of the universe that resonated so deeply with me. The enigma of quantum mechanics and the rigid linearity of time left me searching for answers, hoping that somehow, through my journey with the Riemann hypothesis, I might find the cyclic patterns and deeper symmetries that could unlock a new understanding of the universe. As I continued my exploration into the mysteries of the universe, I turned to general relativity, GR, hoping to find answers to the questions that had long troubled me. Einstein's elegant theory, which described gravity not as a force but as the curvature of spacetime itself, had always fascinated me. The way massive objects could bend the fabric of the universe, causing planets to orbit stars and light to bend around galaxies, was a revelation. It was as if the universe itself was a vast, flexible web, constantly warping and shifting in response to the presence of mass and energy. Yet, even GR, with all its beauty and precision, seemed to have its limits. One of the most perplexing issues was the introduction of the cosmological constant, often represented by the Greek letter lambda. Einstein initially introduced this term to allow for a static universe, one that wasn't expanding or contracting, as was believed at the time. But when it was later discovered that the universe was indeed expanding, Einstein famously dismissed the cosmological constant, calling it his biggest blunder. However, the story didn't end there. In the late 20th century, observations of distant supernovae revealed that the universe's expansion wasn't just continuing, it was accelerating. This was a stunning discovery, one that defied expectations and required a new explanation. Theoretical physicists, needing something to account for this unexpected acceleration, revived the cosmological constant, but this time it was reinterpreted as something entirely different, dark energy. Dark energy is a mysterious force, one that makes up about 70% of the universe and drives its accelerating expansion. But what exactly is it? No one really knows. It's as if the universe is being pushed apart by an invisible hand, a force that permeates all of space yet remains utterly elusive. Dark energy doesn't fit neatly into our existing theories and it doesn't interact with matter in any way we can directly observe. It's as if the universe itself is haunted by an unknown presence, something we can only infer from its effects. General relativity works well up to a certain point, explaining the motion of planets, the bending of light around massive objects, a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing, or Einstein rings, and the structure of the universe on large scales. But beyond a certain threshold, GR starts to falter. Dark matter, another enigmatic substance that makes up about 27% of the universe, is a case in point. While GR can explain the way dark matter bends light and affects the motion of galaxies, it cannot explain what dark matter actually is. It's as if we are seeing shadows in the night, knowing they are cast by something real, but unable to see the object itself. Einstein rings, named after the very man who laid down the principles of GR, are a striking example of this. When light from a distant galaxy passes by a massive object, like another galaxy or a black hole, the gravity of that object can bend the light into a ring or arc. This phenomenon was predicted by Einstein's theory and confirmed by observations, but when the lensing is caused by dark matter, it's as if the universe is showing us a ghostly image of something that's there but not fully understood. Dark matter doesn't emit, absorb, or reflect light, making it invisible to our eyes and our instruments. We only know it's there because of the gravitational effects it has on the visible matter around it. Yet, when it comes to explaining what dark matter actually is, Gia remains silent. The same can be said for dark energy. GR can describe the effects, but it doesn't give us the tools to understand the cause. It's like trying to read a book with half the pages missing, we get glimpses of the story, but the crucial details remain hidden. And then, there are the limits of GR itself. Beyond certain extremes, such as the conditions at the heart of black holes or the very beginning of the universe, GR breaks down. The equations lead to singularities, points where the curvature of space-time becomes infinite and the laws of physics as we know them cease to apply. It's as if GR, despite all its power, can only take us so far before it reaches a precipice beyond which it cannot go. The frustration I felt was palpable. I had hoped that GR would provide a solid framework for understanding the cosmos, but instead, it left me with more questions than answers. The dark land factor, the enigma of dark energy, the invisible nature of dark matter, and the breakdown of GR at the edges of our understanding, all of these pointed to gaps in our knowledge, gaps that I felt ill-equipped to fill. 
I was left wondering if there were deeper principles, hidden symmetries, or new dimensions of reality that could unify these disparate pieces of the puzzle. I was searching for a way to challenge these one-way stories, to find a cyclic or holistic view of the universe that resonated with my own beliefs. But the tools I had, the theories I knew, seemed inadequate to the task. I was left with the unsettling realization that even our most advanced theories might only be scratching the surface of a far more complex and interconnected reality. The story of black holes and the battle of ideas surrounding them is one of the most fascinating sagas in modern physics. It all began with Einstein's general relativity, which predicted the existence of black holes, regions of space where gravity is so intense that nothing, not even light, can escape. These objects were initially thought to be theoretical curiosities, but over time, evidence mounted that they were not just real, but abundant in the universe. Stephen Hawking, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, made groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of black holes. In the 1970s, he proposed what became known as Hawking radiation, the idea that black holes could emit particles due to quantum effects near their event horizons. This was revolutionary because it suggested that black holes could gradually lose mass and eventually evaporate, a notion that seemed to violate the traditional understanding of physics, where information about the material that falls into a black hole would be lost forever. This led to the famous black hole information paradox. The debate over the fate of information in black holes sparked what became known as the Black Hole War, a scientific conflict that pitted Hawking against other theoretical physicists, including Leonard Susskind and Gerard T. Hooft. Susskind, in particular, argued that information could not be destroyed, as this would violate the fundamental laws of quantum mechanics. Instead, he proposed the concept of black hole complementarity and, later, the holographic principle. The holographic principle, inspired by the work of Jacob Bekenstein and further developed by Susskind, posits that the information contained within a volume of space can be thought of as encoded on a boundary to the region, much like a hologram. In the context of black holes, this means that all the information that falls into a black hole is somehow preserved on its event horizon. This idea was a radical departure from the conventional understanding of space-time and suggested that our universe itself might be a hologram, a three-dimensional reality encoded on a two-dimensional surface. The idea of a holographic universe is both mind-bending and difficult to grasp. It suggests that our perception of three-dimensional space could be an illusion, a projection of information stored on a distant, two-dimensional boundary. For someone like me, who had always thought of the universe as a vast, tangible expanse, this concept was hard to accept. The notion that everything we experience could be a mere projection, with the true reality lying on the edge of the universe, seemed almost too abstract, too far removed from the everyday world. But the evidence supporting this idea continued to grow. The discovery of gravitational waves in 2016, ripples in space-time caused by the collision of black holes, provided further confirmation of general relativity and the existence of black holes. These observations, made by the LIGO and Virgo collaborations, marked a monumental achievement in experimental physics and confirmed the predictions made decades earlier by theorists like Hawking. Despite these advances, I struggled with the implications of the holographic principle. If the universe is indeed a hologram, what does that mean for our understanding of reality? How could a three-dimensional world be encoded in just two dimensions? And if black holes are a part of this holographic universe, then what about white holes, the hypothetical opposite of black holes, where matter and energy could emerge rather than be trapped? The concept of a white hole intrigued me. If black holes could suck in everything, could there be objects in the universe that did the opposite? Could white holes be the other side of black holes, connected through some kind of cosmic wormhole? These questions haunted me as I delved deeper into the mysteries of the cosmos. Yet, the more I read and studied, the more I realized that many of these questions were still unresolved. The black hole war, while leading to significant theoretical breakthroughs, didn't provide all the answers. It clarified the nature of black holes and their role in quantum mechanics but left open the bigger question of what this means for our understanding of the universe as a whole. It wasn't until I began working on the Riemann hypothesis that I started to see connections between these abstract ideas and the mathematical structures that underlie the universe. The Riemann hypothesis, a deep and unresolved question in number theory, seemed to hint at hidden symmetries and connections that might bridge the gap between the physical and the mathematical. 
As I immersed myself in this work, I began to see the possibility of a unifying framework that could tie together the mysteries of black holes, the holographic principle, and the nature of reality itself. The story of black holes, the holographic universe, and the quest to reconcile quantum mechanics with general relativity is far from over. But for me, the journey led to a deeper understanding of the interconnectedness of all things and the realization that the answers might lie in the most unexpected places. Supersymmetry, or SUSY, once hailed as the potential key to unlocking a deeper understanding of the universe, faced a significant blow when the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, failed to find evidence supporting it. The theory posited that every fundamental particle had a heavier superpartner, a symmetrical counterpart that could potentially explain some of the universe's biggest mysteries, including the nature of dark matter and the unification of forces. But as the LHC's data came in, it became clear that if supersymmetry exists, it either operates at energy levels beyond the LHC's reach or manifests in a way we haven't yet understood. Despite this setback, string theorists remained hopeful. They continued to explore the vast landscape of string theory, a framework suggesting that the fundamental particles we observe are not point-like dots, but rather tiny, vibrating strings. The beauty of string theory lies in its mathematical elegance and its potential to unify all the forces of nature, including gravity, in a single, coherent framework. Ed Witten, a towering figure in theoretical physics, introduced the concept of brands two-dimensional membranes existing within a higher-dimensional hyperspace. This idea suggested that our observable universe could be just one such brain, floating in a higher-dimensional space where the other dimensions are compactified or hidden from our view. What fascinated me about Witten's work was the explanation it offered for the apparent weakness of gravity compared to the other fundamental forces. If gravity can spread out across multiple dimensions, while the other forces are confined to our brain, this could account for why gravity seems so feeble at the scales we can observe. This notion of extra dimensions and brands opened up a whole new realm of possibilities where the universe wasn't limited to the familiar three dimensions of space and one of time. It suggested that there could be hidden dimensions, perhaps curled up so tightly that they are imperceptible to us, or even entire parallel universes, each with its own set of physical laws. Brian Greene and Max Tegmark were among the physicists who took these ideas further, proposing multiverse models that pushed the boundaries of our understanding even more. Green's work on string theory and the idea of a multiverse where multiple universes could exist with different laws of physics and Tegmark's classifications of different types of multiverse showed me that the cosmos could be far more vast and varied than we ever imagined. These concepts challenged the traditional notion of a single, finite universe and instead pointed to a reality that might be infinite in scope, with countless possibilities. The idea of the multiverse resonated deeply with me. It suggested that the universe we see is just one of many, and that somewhere, in a different universe, the fundamental constants could be different, the laws of physics could vary, and reality itself could take forms we can't even begin to comprehend. This vast, infinite landscape of possibilities was both humbling and exhilarating, as it reminded me that our understanding of the cosmos is still in its infancy. Yet, as I delved deeper into these theories, I couldn't help but feel a sense of frustration. The elegance of these models was undeniable, but they also felt somewhat disconnected from the tangible reality we experience. The mathematics behind them was beautiful, but the lack of experimental evidence left me yearning for something more concrete. I began to see the allure of infinity in these theories, how they pushed the boundaries of what we could imagine, but I also realized the danger of becoming too enamored with the abstract, with ideas that might forever remain out of reach. It was during this period of grappling with these grand, speculative ideas that I found solace in the more grounded, yet equally profound, world of mathematics. The Riemann hypothesis, with its deep connections to prime numbers and the very fabric of number theory, offered a different kind of infinity, one that was not just theoretical, but deeply intertwined with the structure of reality itself. The journey into supersymmetry, string theory, and the multiverse expanded my horizons, showing me the vastness of what could be. But it also brought me back to the realization that infinity, whether in the cosmos or in the realm of numbers, is not just a distant, unreachable concept. It is something that we engage with every day, in every equation, in every pattern we seek to understand. And it was this realization that ultimately led me to the work that would change my life, the quest to prove the Riemann hypothesis. 
As I began to revisit the most challenging problems faced by theoretical physicists, I couldn't help but reflect on the enigma of quantum gravity, the seemingly insurmountable task of reconciling the smooth, continuous fabric of spacetime described by general relativity with the discrete, probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. Gravity, often viewed as the weakest of the fundamental forces, no longer struck me as weak in the traditional sense. Instead, its pervasive, ever-present nature reminded me of the way temperature works, where we can approach absolute zero but never quite reach it. This analogy sparked a thought, just as absolute zero is a theoretical limit that can never be truly attained, perhaps there is no such thing as absolute zero gravity. Gravity, I realized, must be omnipresent, even in the most seemingly empty regions of space. The absence of gravity would imply a void where spacetime itself ceases to exist, a concept that is not just counterintuitive but impossible. The notorious challenge of quantum gravity also brought to mind the staggering 120 orders of magnitude discrepancy between the predicted and observed energy of empty space, a gap that has puzzled physicists for decades. This mismatch is a glaring sign that our current theories, brilliant as they are, may be missing something fundamental. I propose that instead of directly quantizing gravity as we do with the other forces, we might need to consider an approach that gradually dilutes this vast energy gap. By doing so, we could perhaps extend the boundaries of standard cosmology, pushing the limits of our understanding without breaking the fundamental laws of physics. In this expanded view, the concept of the multiverse, often dismissed as speculative, began to seem less far-fetched. If the fundamental constants of nature, such as the speed of light, could vary across different universes, the key to unification might lie in ensuring that these variations are balanced. For example, if the speed of light were slower in another universe, some other constant, perhaps Planck's constant or the gravitational constant, might need to adjust correspondingly to maintain the overall harmony of physical laws. This idea led me to think about the interconnectedness of the physical constants that define our universe. The notion that these constants could be exchanged or compensated across different universes intrigued me. It suggested a deeper, more fundamental level of reality where the laws of physics are not just local rules, but part of a grander, cosmic symphony that spans across the multiverse. As I pondered these ideas, I felt a sense of clarity. The work I had done on the Riemann hypothesis, with its intricate balance of patterns and symmetries, had given me a new lens through which to view the cosmos. It was as if the mathematical insights I had gained were beginning to illuminate the path forward, offering new ways to think about the most profound mysteries of existence. I knew that these ideas were still in their infancy, and much work lay ahead to develop them into a coherent theory. But for the first time, I felt that I had something meaningful to contribute to the discussion of quantum gravity, a way to bridge the gap between the abstract and the tangible, between the finite and the infinite. With this newfound perspective, I was ready to tackle the next great challenge. As always, I would draw on the patterns and principles I had discovered through my work on the Riemann hypothesis, using them as a guide to navigate the uncharted territories of theoretical physics. The journey was far from over, but I felt more equipped than ever to explore the mysteries that lay ahead. As I delved deeper into the mysteries of the universe, the question of dark matter, an elusive substance that makes up roughly 27% of the universe, kept haunting me. Its existence was inferred from its gravitational effects, yet it remained invisible, undetectable by the light it fails to emit or reflect. The particle-based approach seemed appealing at first, especially with the discovery of the pentaquark by the Large Hadron Collider, LHC. This complex particle, made up of five quarks, appeared promising as a potential candidate for dark matter. However, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that even if pentaquarks or similar particles contributed to dark matter, they would not account for the entire 27%. The gap was simply too vast. The data we receive from the universe, light from living galaxies, paints a picture, but it's a picture with crucial pieces missing. When we measure the light-to-mass ratio of galaxies, we're effectively averaging across different ages and generations of these star systems. This averaging process, while useful, overlooks a significant aspect, the remnants of dead galaxies, stars, and star systems that no longer emit light. These remnants, scattered across the cosmos and buried deep within the cosmic microwave background, CMB, radiation, are like echoes of a forgotten era, whispering the secrets of a universe long past. For a long time, the CMB was considered the baby picture of our universe, a snapshot of the cosmos shortly after the Big Bang. It was believed to contain clues about the early formation of galaxies and the distribution of matter. 
But as I pondered the data and its implications, another idea took shape in my mind. What if the CMB wasn't just a relic of the beginning, but also a graveyard of sorts? What if it held the traces of past, dead universes and star systems, their energy signatures faded but not entirely erased? This realization brought a new perspective to the dark matter puzzle. If the remnants of ancient galaxies and stars, those that had burned out and ceased to shine, were included in the CMB data, it could mean that dark matter isn't just something existing in the present. It could be the accumulated mass of everything that has ever existed, lost in time but still exerting a gravitational pull on the fabric of the universe. The idea that dark matter could be lost in time resonated with me. It suggested that what we perceive as dark matter might not be entirely mysterious particles or exotic matter, but rather the mass of a universe that has moved beyond its visible face. This concept challenged the traditional view, and it was a difficult pill to swallow. Yet, it made a strange sort of sense. The more I explored this idea, the more it seemed plausible that the dark matter problem could be tied to our understanding, or rather, misunderstanding, of the CMB. By reinterpreting the CMB not as the baby picture of our universe, but as a complex, lead record of the cosmos's entire history, we could be on the brink of a breakthrough in understanding dark matter. This was a radical departure from the conventional approach, and I knew it would face skepticism. Yet, after proving the Riemann hypothesis, I had learned to trust the insights that emerged from looking at the patterns and structures underlying complex problems. Here, too, I saw a pattern, one that linked the past and present in a way that could potentially solve one of the greatest mysteries in cosmology. I was ready to dig deeper, to challenge the existing paradigms and explore the possibility that dark matter is not just a shadow lurking in the present universe, but a ghost of the cosmos's past. And as I continued my journey, I felt a growing confidence that I was on the right path, guided once again by the principles that had illuminated my way through the Riemann hypothesis. Dark energy has always been a more enigmatic concept compared to dark matter. Unlike dark matter, which at least has some gravitational footprint in our universe, dark energy is a force that seems to drive the universe apart, accelerating its expansion with no clear link to the known spatial dimensions or even the extra dimensions postulated by string theorists. It's as if dark energy exists on a different plane altogether, one that's intimately connected with the fabric of time itself. What if dark energy isn't something we need to hunt down in the hidden folds of the cosmos but rather something that is intrinsically linked to the very nature of time? The universe is expanding, and as it does, the density of ordinary matter and dark matter decreases, but dark energy remains constant. This constancy suggests that dark energy might be better understood not as a force that acts in space but as a phenomenon that operates within the framework of time. Consider the apparent blunder of quantum mechanics, the 120 orders of magnitude discrepancy between the predicted vacuum energy and what we observe. This is often cited as one of the biggest mismatches between theory and observation in modern physics and it has puzzled physicists for decades. However, if we shift our perspective and view dark energy as something that dilutes over an infinite timescale, it could offer a resolution to this problem. In this context, dark energy would not be an error in our equations or a mysterious substance to be found. Instead, it would represent a fundamental property of the universe's temporal structure, an intrinsic part of the universe's timeline that, as time stretches into infinity, becomes less influential in a way that balances out the extreme values predicted by quantum mechanics. This dilution of dark energy over time aligns with the concept of an infinitely expanding universe. In the distant future, as galaxies move further apart and the observable universe becomes increasingly isolated and cold, dark energy could diffuse into the vastness of time itself. It wouldn't disappear but would become so thinly spread that its effects would be imperceptible. This perspective doesn't require extraspatial dimensions or exotic particles. Instead, it places dark energy within the natural flow of the universe's timeline, offering a potential bridge between the quantum scale and the cosmological scale. It suggests that what we perceive as a discrepancy might instead be a consequence of our limited understanding of time's role in the cosmos. This approach could provide a fresh angle to tackle the unresolved issue of quantum gravity as well. If we consider that both dark energy and the gravity associated with quantum scales need to be unified under the umbrella of time's infinitude, we might begin to see a way forward. The key would be to develop a framework that allows us to quantify gravity in such a way that it naturally dilutes over time, just as dark energy does. 
By doing so, we could begin to close the 120 orders of magnitude gap, not by altering our equations to fit our observations forcefully, but by understanding that our equations need to account for the infinite nature of time. This could be the path to a more comprehensive cosmology, one that unites the forces of the universe without compromising the fundamental laws of physics, allowing for a multiverse where the constants of nature might vary, but the overarching principles remain intact. With this insight, I find myself revisiting the problematic points faced by theoretical physicists. It's like I've been given a new lens to look through, one that clarifies the murky waters of dark energy and offers a more coherent narrative that can be tested and explored. It's a thrilling prospect and one that makes me eager to delve deeper into the mysteries of the universe. The matter versus antimatter imbalance has been one of the most perplexing questions in cosmology. Why do we observe a universe dominated by matter when the laws of physics suggest that matter and antimatter should have been created in equal amounts during the Big Bang? This asymmetry has led to countless theories, but perhaps the answer lies not in a simple imbalance, but in a deeper understanding of how matter and antimatter coexist within the framework of time itself. To resolve this, we need to revisit the concept of CP symmetry, which stands for charge parity symmetry, and how its violation might play a role. CP symmetry suggests that the laws of physics should be the same if a particle is replaced by its antiparticle, C symmetry, and its spatial coordinates are inverted, P symmetry. However, experiments have shown that CP symmetry can be violated, as seen in the decay of neutral kaons. But there's more to the story. If we consider captain symmetry, which adds time reversal, T symmetry, into the equation, the laws of physics should hold if we replace particles with antiparticles, invert their spatial coordinates, and reverse the direction of time. Interestingly, captain symmetry appears to be conserved even when CP symmetry is not, which hints at a deeper, more fundamental symmetry in the universe. Let's take a step further and propose that matter and antimatter are not absolute opposites but rather two sides of the same coin, intricately linked by the passage of time. Imagine protons and neutrons, the building blocks of matter, as being anti in the past and destined to become anti again in the future. In the present, they exist as matter because we are observing them in a specific slice of time. As time progresses, the relationship between matter and antimatter might be governed by a form of symmetry that is only broken when we observe it from our linear, time-bound perspective. If we could step outside of time, beyond the limits of our current understanding, we might see that matter and antimatter coexist eternally, cycling through phases of dominance and recessiveness. In this sense, the apparent dominance of matter in our current universe could be just a temporary state, a product of where we are in the timeline. The universe's history and future might be filled with epochs where antimatter was or will be dominant, balancing the scales over the grand arc of time. This idea is supported by the nature of particles like protons and neutrons. They may have once been antimatter in the early universe and could revert to that state in a far distant future when the conditions of the universe change. As time itself stretches towards infinity, the distinction between matter and antimatter could blur, leading to a state where both coexist eternally, their dance dictated by the flow of time. In the end, the apparent imbalance between matter and antimatter might be an illusion, a consequence of our limited viewpoint within a specific era of the universe. Once we lose the constraint of time, or perhaps in a different context of the universe where time behaves differently, we may find that matter and antimatter are always present, in equilibrium, obeying a universal captain symmetry that transcends our current understanding. This perspective not only offers a new way to think about the matter-antimatter asymmetry but also provides a bridge to other unresolved issues in physics, such as the nature of time itself, and how it could influence the fundamental symmetries of the universe. It suggests that the answers we seek may lie not just in the particles and forces we observe but in the deeper, more elusive fabric of time and how it shapes our reality. Continuing from where we left off. The nature of time has been a subject of deep exploration across various civilizations since antiquity. As a Hindu, I was raised with a perspective that sees time as eternal, akin to a vast stage where all cosmic dramas unfold. This concept is reminiscent of Newton's idea of absolute time, a constant, unchanging backdrop against which the universe plays out its scenes. Even though Einstein's theory of relativity introduced the revolutionary idea that time is relative, dependent on the observer's frame of reference, it never fully eradicated the notion of time's absolute nature. In relativity, time is intertwined with space, forming a four-dimensional fabric known as space-time. 
According to Einstein, time could stretch, compress, or even loop back on itself, depending on the speed and gravity involved. However, this does not necessarily negate the idea of time as an absolute infinity. The concept that time could stretch infinitely in both positive and negative directions resonates deeply with the Hindu worldview. In Hinduism, time is often seen as cyclical, with endless cycles of creation, preservation, and destruction. These cycles are described in terms of yugas, vast epochs that repeat over and over. The largest of these cycles is the Maha Yuga, consisting of four smaller yugas, Sachi Yuga, Treta Yuga, Vipara Yuga, and Kali Yuga. This grand cycle repeats indefinitely, with each yuga having its own characteristics and lengths, adding up to 4.32 million years. This cycle is just a small part of an even larger cycle, the Kalpa, which spans over 4.32 billion years. In this worldview, time has no beginning or end, it is eternal and infinite, constantly looping and renewing itself. This concept of time deeply influenced Carl Sagan, a renowned astrophysicist who was fascinated by the idea of cosmic cycles. Sagan often spoke of the Hindu conception of time as one of the most elegant and profound views of the cosmos. He admired how the Hindu tradition recognized the immense timescales involved in the universe's evolution, long before modern science could measure such vast periods. In contrast, Western science, particularly in the early 20th century, was focused on a linear model of time. The Big Bang Theory, which posits that the universe began as a singularity around 13.8 billion years ago and has been expanding ever since, suggests a beginning and potentially an end to time. This linear perspective seemed limiting to me, as it does not account for the possibility of eternal cycles or the infinite nature of time. As I delved deeper into Einstein's relativity, I realized that while it offered a more dynamic view of time than Newton's static stage, it still left room for the concept of time as infinite. Relativity does not inherently contradict the idea that time could extend infinitely in both directions, it merely complicates our understanding of how time flows and interacts with space and gravity. The Hindu concept of time, with its vast cycles and infinite duration, provided a philosophical counterpoint to the scientific ideas I was exploring. It offered a way to think about time that was not bound by the constraints of a single beginning or end but was instead part of an eternal continuum. As I pondered these ideas, I found myself drawn to the possibility that time, much like the universe itself, could be both finite and infinite, linear and cyclical, depending on the perspective from which it is viewed. This duality, I realized, was not just a philosophical or religious idea but could potentially be a key to understanding the deeper mysteries of the universe, mysteries that I would later find echoes of in my work on the Riemann hypothesis. This journey through the nature of time, influenced by both my cultural heritage and my scientific explorations, would become a foundational element of my quest to unravel the secrets of the universe. It is this blending of ancient wisdom and modern science that continues to guide my thinking as I navigate the complex interplay between mathematics, physics, and the eternal nature of time. Continuing the story. The origin of the universe is a concept that has fascinated humanity for millennia. When we speak of the origin, it often implies a beginning, a specific moment in time when everything started. However, from my perspective and drawing upon the ancient wisdom of my culture, the universe did not have an origin in the conventional sense. If by origin we mean the beginning of time itself, then my answer is simple, time is infinite, stretching both into the future and the past. There was no singular moment of creation and there will be no definitive end. This view contrasts sharply with the dominant scientific model, the Big Bang Theory, which suggests that the universe began from a singularity approximately 13.8 billion years ago. According to this theory, time, space, and matter all emerged from this initial point, expanding and evolving into the cosmos we observe today. But this concept of a singular beginning never sat comfortably with me. It seemed to impose an artificial boundary on something as vast and boundless as the universe. In Hindu cosmology, the universe is eternal, undergoing endless cycles of creation, preservation, and destruction. The universe is periodically destroyed and then reborn, continuing the cycle of existence without a clear beginning or end. This cyclical view of time and the universe provides a framework where the concept of an origin becomes irrelevant. The universe simply asterisk is asterisk, always has been and always will be, in one form or another. This perspective offers a different lens through which to view the cosmos, one that does not require the universe to have a single point of origin. 
It aligns with the idea that time itself is a continuum with no definitive starting or ending points. The Big Bang, in this context, could be seen as just one of many cycles or events in an eternal, ever-evolving universe. When I ponder the question of the universe's origin, I find myself drawn to the concept of infinity, an idea that also plays a crucial role in my work on the Riemann hypothesis. Infinity is not just a mathematical abstraction but a fundamental aspect of the universe itself. It challenges our understanding and forces us to confront the limitations of our perceptions. In this infinite framework, the universe's so-called origin is merely a transition from one state of existence to another. The concept of time as a linear, one-way arrow loses its significance, replaced by a more fluid and expansive understanding of cosmic evolution. This idea also resonates with some modern cosmological theories, such as the notion of a multiverse, where our universe is just one of many, each with its own set of physical laws and constants. In such a scenario, the Big Bang might not be the absolute beginning but rather a local event within a much larger, more complex reality. As I explore these ideas, I find a profound connection between ancient wisdom and contemporary science. Both are attempts to grapple with the infinite, to understand the nature of existence, and to find meaning in the vastness of the cosmos. My work on the Riemann hypothesis, with its focus on the infinite properties of numbers, echoes this quest, bridging the gap between the philosophical and the mathematical. In this sense, the universe's origin is not a singular event but a perpetual unfolding, a continuous journey through time and space that defies simple explanations and linear thinking. It is a reminder that the cosmos is far more complex and mysterious than we can ever fully comprehend, and it is this mystery that drives me to continue exploring, questioning, and seeking new insights. Continuing the story The information paradox surrounding black holes is one of the most profound puzzles in modern theoretical physics. To visualize a black hole, imagine the eye of a supercyclone, a region of immense gravitational pull where nothing, not even light, can escape. This analogy helps to capture the sense of inevitable attraction and the inescapable nature of black holes. Black holes are regions of space-time where gravity is so strong that the escape velocity exceeds the speed of light. The boundary around this region is known as the event horizon. Once something crosses the event horizon, it cannot return, it is drawn inexorably toward the singularity at the black hole's center, where density and gravity become infinite. This leads to the information paradox, a concept first brought into focus by Stephen Hawking in the 1970s. According to quantum mechanics, information about the physical state of matter must be preserved. However, when matter falls into a black hole, it seems that all information about it is lost. If the black hole eventually evaporates due to Hawking radiation, where does that information go? Does it disappear from the universe entirely, violating the principles of quantum mechanics? The paradox lies in the apparent conflict between general relativity and quantum mechanics. General relativity suggests that the information is lost, while quantum mechanics insists it must be preserved. This contradiction has baffled physicists for decades and has led to numerous theories attempting to resolve it. One of the most compelling solutions proposed involves the idea that black holes are not the ultimate vaults of destruction we once thought they were. Instead, they might function more like cosmic holograms. The holographic principle, as suggested by physicists like Leonard Susskind and Gerard T. Hooft, posits that all the information that falls into a black hole is somehow encoded on its event horizon. This two-dimensional surface might store the information in such a way that, even as the black hole evaporates, the information is not truly lost but is instead smeared across the cosmos in a manner that preserves it. This idea fundamentally challenges our conventional understanding of space and time, suggesting that our three-dimensional world might be a projection of information encoded on a distant, two-dimensional surface. This concept of a holographic universe offers a tantalizing way to reconcile the laws of physics and resolve the paradox. If we rebuild the picture of the black hole using this framework, we can see it not just as a point of no return but as a dynamic object where the information about the matter it consumes is retained, albeit in a radically transformed way. The black hole becomes less of a destroyer and more of a transformer, a complex process where the nature of information and its preservation transcends our traditional understanding. This view also aligns with the concept of black hole complementarity, which suggests that there is no contradiction between the different descriptions of a black hole from various perspectives. For an outside observer, information never truly crosses the event horizon but rather gets increasingly redshifted and spread out across it. 
For an observer falling into the black hole, however, the journey to the singularity would appear smooth and continuous. By reimagining black holes in this way, we can see them not as enigmatic destroyers but as crucial components in the cosmic dance of information. They might hold the key to understanding the fundamental nature of reality itself, offering insights into the interplay between gravity, quantum mechanics, and the fabric of the universe. The information paradox, therefore, is not just a problem to be solved but a gateway to deeper understanding, a challenge that pushes the boundaries of what we know and compels us to rethink our most basic assumptions about the universe. In resolving this paradox, we might also resolve some of the greatest mysteries in physics, bringing us closer to a unified theory of everything. Continuing the story. The hierarchy problem in physics highlights the vast difference between the strength of gravity and the other fundamental forces, such as electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear forces. Gravity, though all-encompassing, is astonishingly weak in comparison. This discrepancy is often visualized through the scales at which these forces operate, with gravity only becoming comparable to the other forces at the Planck scale, far beyond the reach of current experimental physics. One perspective I've come to embrace is that gravity is not truly a force in the conventional sense but rather the curvature of spacetime itself. Its apparent weakness is a consequence of its universality, gravity is shared across all possible multiverse if such multiverse exist. This sharing dilutes its strength when we measure it within our own universe, giving the illusion of weakness. The scale gaps that physicists grapple with may also be a reflection of the absence of cycles in our current mathematical frameworks. In structures like Pascal's triangle, we see a hierarchy of numbers that might suggest deeper patterns within quantum mechanics, QM, as well. If we could introduce cycles into our mathematical understanding, perhaps we could smooth out these discrepancies, bringing even the vast Planck scale into a more comprehensible range. The concept of hierarchy could then be seen not as a problem but as a feature of a more complex, cyclical structure that governs the universe. Supersymmetry, once hailed as a possible solution to the hierarchy problem, now seems less necessary in this view. The idea that every particle has a superpartner has yet to be confirmed experimentally, and its absence at the scales we can observe suggests that nature might have found a simpler way to organize itself. Similarly, the notion of extra dimensions, once a staple of string theory and other speculative models, might also dissolve back into the familiar three-dimensional space we experience, leaving us with a universe that is simpler but no less profound. The anthropic principle, which suggests that the universe's parameters are fine-tuned for life, offers little satisfaction as an explanation. It feels like an admission of defeat, a way of saying, things are the way they are because we happen to be here to observe them. This line of thinking does not solve the hierarchy problem but rather sidesteps it. A more promising approach might be to move away from the abstract, sometimes inscrutable world of imaginary numbers that lies at the heart of quantum field theory, QFT. These imaginary components are essential in the mathematics of quantum mechanics, where they represent the probabilistic nature of particles and waves. However, if we could somehow collapse these probabilities into realities, turning the abstract into the concrete, we might uncover a simpler, more intuitive understanding of the universe. By collapsing the wave function and realizing these imaginary numbers into reality, we could potentially unlock a new way of seeing the cosmos. The complex interactions that now seem so tangled and impenetrable might suddenly appear clear and straightforward, revealing underlying cycles and patterns that were previously hidden. This shift could not only address the hierarchy problem but also bridge the gap between the quantum and classical worlds, offering a more unified picture of the forces that shape our universe. In this new light, the universe might no longer seem like a chaotic collection of disparate forces and inexplicable hierarchies. Instead, it would become a coherent, comprehensible system where everything fits together in a way that is both simple and profound. The hierarchy problem would no longer be a problem at all but a natural outcome of the cycles and structures that underpin all of reality. Concluding my story. It was just an attempt to resolve some of the pain areas within the vast realm of physics. I acknowledge that physics is not my core subject, my background lies elsewhere, and my journey has been one of exploration and curiosity. I believe that I have proved the Riemann hypothesis, and in that light, I ventured to apply my insights to some of the unresolved problems in physics. I understand that this is a domain filled with intricate theories, established paradigms, and ongoing debates. My approach may seem unconventional, and I fully recognize that stepping into these restricted zones could be seen as overstepping boundaries. 
However, my intention has never been to challenge the experts or undermine the work of those who have dedicated their lives to these subjects. Instead, I offer my views humbly as an outsider looking in, hoping that my perspective might spark new thoughts or discussions. You may adopt my views or freely discard them. I ask only that my attempt be seen in the spirit of intellectual exploration rather than a definitive statement on the nature of the universe. Please don't see this as a personal challenge or an affront to the established norms. It is merely a reflection of my journey, my thoughts, and my attempt to connect the dots between the mathematical and physical worlds. Whether or not these ideas hold water in the grand scheme of things is for the broader scientific community to determine. For me, it has been a fascinating and enlightening exploration, and I am grateful for the opportunity to share it with you.